This lecture continues our look at the psychological aspects of chronic and life-threatening illnesses by taking a look at the uh, psychological aspects of cancer. To start with, uh, we should take a look at exactly what cancer is. It's something certainly everybody has somewhat familiarity with, but we may not have a really good understanding of uh, exactly what a cancer diagnosis means or uh, what the illness is like in terms of the illness characteristics. So let's start off by watching this brief video from the, Amer from the MD Anderson Cancer Research Center on uh, uh, exactly what is cancer. What is cancer? Contrary to what many people believe, cancer isn't just one disease. There are more than 100 common types of cancer and many more subtypes, which can occur anywhere in the body. Sarcomas are cancers that originate in muscle, fibrous tissue, or fat, known as soft tissue sarcomas, or in bone and cartilage. Leukemias are cancers of the blood cells, arising in the blood-forming organs, bone marrow, and the spleen. Lymphomas affect the lymphatic system, a network of vessels and nodes that acts as the body's filter. There are at least 30, and perhaps more, different types of lymphomas. Carcinomas, the most common cancers, arise in the body's organs. About 80% of all cancers are carcinomas. Examples are cancers of the breast, prostate, stomach, colon, and as the skin is an organ, also include squamous and basal cell skin cancers. There are a few cancers that don't fit into these major categories. Melanomas, for example, are not considered carcinomas even though they arise from skin cells and certain types of brain tumors have their own classification. Cancer begins in the body's cells. All parts of the body, organs, muscles, skin, even bones and blood, are composed of cells. Cells are constantly dividing and multiplying to replace old, damaged cells. Dividing is part of a normal cell's lifespan. Cells grow, divide, and die in an orderly fashion. However, if this orderly process is disrupted and cells begin to grow out of control, they form excess tissue known as a tumor. In most cases, tumors are benign, meaning that they are not cancerous. Benign tumors can occur almost anywhere. Although they may cause some health problems depending on their size and location and may have to be removed, they are usually not life-threatening. However, if cells are cancer cells, they grow, divide, and eventually form malignant tumors. Malignant tumors, unlike benign tumors, invade and destroy surrounding tissues and nearby organs. Eventually, cancer cells break off and spread through the blood or lymphatic system to form new tumors in other parts of the body. This process, the spread of cancer from its original site, is known as metastasis. Cancers that originate in the breast or colon, for example, typically metastasize to the brain, lung, liver, or bone, forming new tumors there. Metastasis can be a slow process, occurring over a number of years, or can happen rapidly, within a few weeks. Scientists are not sure why. Left untreated, cancers continue to grow, invade, and spread taking over and destroying the organs where they originate, as well as those to which they spread and metastasize. As this happens, the person will eventually begin to experience symptoms related to the organs affected. To understand what causes cancer to occur, 
we must look deeper into the cell, at the genes that control the cell's growth and behavior, and how the cell's normal function may be disrupted or damaged. Since it is the genes that regulate the normal, orderly behavior of cells, abnormalities or damage to cells' genetic components cause them to behave abnormally, to become cancers. In some cases, people have inherited genes that may predispose them to cancer, while in other cases, genes are damaged by external environmental factors, such as smoking, exposure to chemicals or ultraviolet radiation, and perhaps even viruses. Not all of the causes of genetic cell damage are known, and in many cases, it's probably not one, but a combination of factors. There are still many unknowns Research has unraveled many of the mysteries of cancer, and new discoveries are happening every day. The more we learn about cancer, the more targeted and specialized our therapies are becoming. There was a time, not too long ago, when a diagnosis of cancer was perhaps the worst medical news you could receive. But today, if you or someone you love has cancer, it's important to remember that many cancers that were once fatal are now curable and many more are treatable than ever before in history. All right, so that video gave us a very good introduction to exactly uh, what cancer is, as well as the various different types of cancers and some of the mechanisms of how um, uh, cancer operates. As mentioned at the end of that video, uh, cancer was once thought of as a death sentence, as exclusively as a life-threatening illness, uh, one that uh, without treatment and a lot of luck, um, people would probably not survive. Uh, now we think of many cancers more as a chronic illness, uh, that people can live for years and years uh, after diagnosis, uh, perhaps with some repeated treatment attempts or maybe some ongoing uh, low-level treatment. Uh, and many people experience a cure where they experience complete remission of the cancer and a no recurrence for the rest of their lives. And that's terrific news. Um, as life expectancy increases due to the advances in treating other illnesses, especially infectious illnesses and prevention, the lifetime prevalence of cancer rises. And so uh, while it looks like um, the prevalence of cancer is growing and growing, and at times it seems like almost everybody uh, gets cancer, uh, that's partly a result of the good news in other areas of uh, health care, where the advances and lengthening of life expectancy just increases the chances that people will develop uh, cancer over time. I want to show you another short video from the American Cancer Society that will look at some of the recent trends in cancer statistics in terms of uh, who gets cancer, what types of cancer, and um, other information. Hello, I'm Dr. Otis Brawley. Every year, the American Cancer Society publishes cancer statistics for the United States. The 2011 version is available right now. The leading cancers at diagnosis for men are prostate, lung, colorectal cancer, and urinary bladder cancer. The leading four cancers for women in order are breast, lung, colorectal, and uterine cancer. The most common causes of cancer death in men are lung, followed by prostate, colorectal, and pancreas. And in women are lung, breast, colorectal, and pancreas. In this slide, you see the absolute number of people dying in the United States starting in the mid-1970s and going onward to 2007. Uh, the blue, that is the blue line. The red line is how many people we estimate would have died if the, breath, if the cancer rate of death had continued uh, at its 1991 rate. Something very important happened in 1991, and that is that the risk of death in the United States started going down. 
Indeed, an American today has a 17 to 18 percent lower risk of dying of cancer than an American in 1991. Uh, with this estimate, the integration of those uh, red up and down lines, we estimate that 900,000 Americans did not die between 1991 and 2007 because of institution of cancer prevention and control uh, uh, interventions. Uh, this is smoking cessation, improvements in treatment, improvements in screening. In this slide, you can see death rates from cancer for women from 1930 to 2007. You can see in the pink line a decline in the death rate from breast cancer that started in the late 1980s. Indeed, the death rate or risk of death from breast cancer for American women has decreased by 34 percent over the last 25 years. You also see in gray there a dramatic rise in lung cancer death rates among women. Uh, lung cancer death rates among women are only starting to decline in the last several years. This is because men actually started uh, decreasing their uh, smoking rates uh, well before women did. Each edition of Cancer Facts and Figures has a special section looking at one particular problem. This year we look at cancer disparities and premature deaths. New methods of analysis actually give us greater insight into cancer disparities. This slide shows us the total number of premature deaths, that is cancer deaths for people ages 25 to 64, that could have been avoided in 2007 by eliminating economic and racial disparities. More than 60,000 cancer deaths would have been avoided in that year if there were no economic or racial disparities in cancer. In this slide, we see the total number of premature deaths, that is deaths from cancer for people aged 25 to 64 that could have been avoided in 2007 by eliminating economic and racial disparities among African Americans. Black Americans have the highest death rates of any racial or ethnic group in the United States. If blacks had the death rate of the most uh, educated Americans in the United States, 41 percent of deaths actually would have been avoided. If blacks had the white death rate, only 20 percent of deaths would have been avoided. Socioeconomic status is actually a much greater driver of the high death rate among blacks than is race in and of itself. This has been a very brief overview of cancer facts and figures. Assessment of the actual numbers actually helps us understand what the scientific problems truly are, helps us set a scientific agenda, also helps us figure out what policies need to be implemented if we're truly going to overcome cancer. Thank you for listening. So a very interesting video there. Uh, some good news and bad news, I suppose. The good news is, of course, the overall death rate from cancer is declining and declining quite rapidly. Uh, your generation is fortunate to be uh, seeing a, a major turnaround in our approaches to both preventing and treating cancers. And you'll notice he said that that improvement was not just due to improvements in treating cancer, but also in uh, prevention and control. Things like tobacco prevention are a big part of that, as well as improvements in early screening that make treatment more effective by catching cancers earlier. Uh, of course, some of the bad news of that presentation was that uh, economic and racial disparities persist that result in uh, some Americans having uh, less good outcomes related to uh, cancer deaths. Uh, it's interesting that Dr. Brawley uh, concluded that uh, economic disparities are a larger factor than uh, racial differences in and of themselves in determining those disparities. But uh, certainly something we have to continue to address as a country is uh, making sure that uh, uh, people have opportunities to get uh, adequate uh, treatment and to uh, survive a cancer diagnosis despite uh, racial or economic differences.
This chart shows also some of those impressive uh, improvements in cancer outcomes. This chart here focuses on childhood cancers. Those are the most common co childhood cancers down the left-hand side of the figure. And you see in the gray bar are the survival rates in 1962, so just, uh, just over 50 years ago. And the red bars show the uh, survival rates um, around 2010. And that's pretty impressive, dramatic improvements. If you look at, uh, for example, uh, uh, Ewing sarcoma, next from the bottom. In 1962, a child would have only had a 5% chance of surviving that, even five years. Um, and uh, in uh, now, we would see a survival rate of 65%, and actually today that rate's closer to 80%. What a dramatic turnaround in survival rates uh, for that treatment for only a, uh, about two generations ago would have been virtually a certain uh, death sentence uh, now is um, highly likely to be survivable um, for kids who can survive then into adulthood. So terrific improvements we've seen in survival rates uh, for childhood cancers. And these are not uncommon for lots of uh, similar kinds of patterns for lots of adult cancers as well. Now we should talk for just a minute about some of the psychological aspects of cancer. Uh, cancer is certainly not just a medical uh, situation, but it's a major psychological and emotional issue, and an issue for families and relationships. Uh, there's a number of different things we could uh, uh, point out about psychological aspects. Uh, first, and maybe most obvious, is how people adjust to the diagnosis. The diagnosis of cancer is often met with uh, feelings of shock and fear. Uh, what does this mean? What does it mean for my future? Um, what does it mean for my survival? Uh, can be met with sadness or depression as well as anxiety. Uh, so that initial uh, shocking diagnosis of cancer um, often brings up lots of acute uh, emotional consequences for folks. Once you're past that initial acute phase, people then need to uh, often come to terms with coping with treatment. Uh, treatment for most cancers, while um, more effective than it's ever been, is often uh, quite difficult. Um, can involve lots of uh, very challenging, difficult side effects. Um, uh, because the treatments are very aggressive toward the cancer, they also take a tremendous toll on the uh, on the healthy aspects of the body as well. So people in treatment for cancer often have to cope with pain. That may be uh, localized or temporary pain associated with procedures or surgeries, but can be more chronic pain depending on the type of cancer and the location. Often people have to deal with the uh, side effects of treatment, including things like terrible nausea, loss of appetite, uh, weight loss, uh, terrible fatigue. At times, people need to cope with changes that might be related to the cancer. So, for example, people may have new disabilities. Uh, depending on the cancer and location, people may experience uh, amputations uh, that may introduce new disabilities into individuals' lives. People may have to cope with disfigurement, uh, things like scars or the loss of the integrity of the body that might challenge one's self-image. Um, for example, um, uh, losing breasts or testicles that might challenge one's sense of sexuality or what it means to be a man or a woman. And people may experience changes to their roles. Um, one of the roles that people often have to adopt as a, a new individual di newly diagnosed with cancer is somebody who is receiving care. And if you're somebody who has been uh, perhaps a, a leading caregiver or breadwinner for the family um, and you lose that role, you may lose role as, a, as a, someone with a career, at least temporarily during the treatment for the cancer, um, those can be incredibly uh, challenging. Uh, sometimes, if treatment is successful, people have to cope with survivorship, which uh, often is um, a good thing to cope with, of course, because one has survived the cancer, but there can be all sorts of issues with that in terms of coping with fears of recurrence, in terms of perhaps survivor guilt. Um, uh, of many people who are in cancer develop close friendships with other people who may be in treatment with them, and uh, there may be guilt if uh, some of those uh, loved ones do not uh, survive their cancer, uh, but the, uh, but you do. And of course, sometimes uh, cancer has um, uh, the worst outcomes, which is loss of life. And so individuals may have to uh, cope with end-of-life issues. Uh, that's something we will return to um, in a few lectures. 
sometimes when we think about the uh, the trauma of a cancer diagnosis, we often think about uh, the kinds of psychological adjustment problems that come with trauma, things like post-traumatic stress disorder. However, there can be different outcomes as well. Uh, consider uh, uh, this woman, uh, Stacy Kramer's perspective, as she presented it at a TED Talk a few years ago. Imagine, if you will, a gift. I'd like for you to picture it in your mind. It's not too big, about the size of a golf ball. So envision what it looks like all wrapped up. And before I show you what's inside, I will tell you it's going to do incredible things for you. It will bring all of your family together. You will feel loved and appreciated like never before and reconnect with friends and acquaintances you haven't heard from in years. Adoration and admiration will overwhelm you. It will recalibrate what's most important in your life. It will redefine your sense of spirituality and faith. You'll have a new understanding and trust in your body. You'll have unsurpassed vitality and energy. You'll expand your vocabulary, meet new people, and you'll have a healthier lifestyle. And get this, you'll have an eight-week vacation of doing absolutely nothing. You'll eat countless gourmet meals. Flowers will arrive by the truckload. People will say to you, you look great. Have you had any work done? And you'll have a lifetime supply of good drugs. You'll be challenged, inspired, motivated, and humbled. Your life will have new meaning. Peace, health, serenity, happiness. Nirvana. The price? $55,000. And that's an incredible deal. By now, I know you're dying to know what it is and where you can get one. Does Amazon carry it? Does it have the Apple logo on it? Is there a waiting list? Not likely. This gift came to me about five months ago and looked more like this when it was all wrapped up. Not quite so pretty. And this. And then this. It was a rare gem, a brain tumor. Hemangioblastoma. The gift that keeps on giving. And while I'm okay now, I wouldn't wish this gift for you. I'm not sure you'd want it, but I wouldn't change my experience. It profoundly altered my life in ways I didn't expect, in all the ways I just shared with you. So the next time you're faced with something that's unexpected, unwanted, and uncertain, consider that it just may be a gift. Namaste. The perspective that she was providing is a really good example of what we call post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is a concept that can exist uh, in the wake of any kind of trauma, but it's been uh, um, studied quite a bit in response to cancer diagnoses. Post-traumatic growth refers to any kind of positive personal changes, such as enhanced appreciation for life, uh, improved closeness in intimate uh, relationships, uh, spiritual growth uh, that may occur. Uh, many people experience some very positive psychological outcomes in the wake of traumatic experiences like a cancer diagnosis. The truth is, this actually may be more common uh, than the negative things like PTSD among cancer survivors. My uh, oldest daughter is now almost 17 years old, and when she was almost three years old, she was diagnosed with cancer. And that was, of course, a tremendous trauma for our family, and we're very fortunate that she received excellent care and treatment and was able to survive that. I remember about a year after her treatments ended, uh, having lunch with a pastor who said to us, um, you know, are you ready for your lives to get back to normal? 
And my response, which kind of surprised even me at the time, was that I kind of hope it doesn't go back to normal defined as the way things were before. And what I meant by that is that we had come to appreciate some great um, improvements in our lives as a result of this, including um, realizing uh, just how fortunate you are to have each and every single day, how things can be taken away um, uh, in the blink of an eye, or how things can be threatened um, in the blink of an eye. And I think that that uh, led to both my wife and I experiencing such a, a rich appreciation and gratitude for daily living that we didn't want to quite live that. That's an example of a post-traumatic growth kind of experience. One of the other interesting things about post-traumatic growth is that it seems to be relatively independent of other psychological outcomes like PTSD and depression. So people, it, rather than post-traumatic growth being thought of as the opposite end of a spectrum and the other end is PTSD, they're actually relatively independent. People can experience post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, things like flashbacks or reoccurrences or avoidance and, and fear of the traumatic experience, and at the same time experience post-traumatic growth. They seem to be somewhat relatively independent um, experiences, which is pretty interesting. So that concludes our overview of some of the psychological aspects of cancer.